Welcome to the show. We're at Microsoft Build with our friends, Brendan, and we're about to learn the secret sauce. Excellent. Yeah. So, Brendan, thanks for taking some time away from. I don't know. Do you have a? Are you speaking at Build? Uh, yeah. Yeah. I, so I spoke yesterday. Okay. Uh, and I'm actually speaking today. I got the um, the 4 p.m. slot. Okay. Which is like you know like the last one before the conference closes. <laughs> right before so, I mean, happy hour. It's gonna be like me and my mom. I think. You know? <laughs> at least it's recorded. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Actually, she's probably not gonna be there. She's probably she's just gonna stream it. Yeah. yeah. Excellent. Yeah. So we we talked to open source maintainers folks in the space about the secret sauce and open source. Uh, you have a lot of the secret sauce because uh, you co-created Kubernetes. True. Um, but before I enter you, why don't you enter yourself, tell the audience who you are. Sure. What do you do? Sure. So I'm Brendan Burns. Um, I'm the corporate vice president for cloud native open source um, on Azure, on Microsoft Azure. Um, and uh, so, yeah, that's that's pretty much what I do. Very cool. Yeah, very, very to the point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Was the history, was I supposed to get the history in there too? I can't remember. Yeah, I mean, you got LinkedIn, right? All right, all right. I mean, I, I can give you the open source history. Though, yeah, I mean, I'd love to, because co-creator of, of Kubernetes, so I'd love to actually take a quick tour of like early days there. So you sure. worked at Google for a long time. Did, yeah. But the need for Kubernetes, like, yeah. can you talk about that story? Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I'm, I might start even earlier in the sense of like my journey into open source. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I think I got into open source originally because... Um, I, uh, I dumpster dived effect effectively behind the IT department at my college, and I oh like literally dumpster dived. Well, I mean it wasn't a dumpster, but it was a pile of old computers. <laughs> okay, you know there wasn't any food in there or anything. Thank goodness, right? Um, but like I got an old, uh, it was a Mac, sixty-eight thousand Motorola Mac, right? Um, but like we did Unix. It was Solaris, I think, at the time in my computer science classes, and so I was like, I can't use a Mac to write my homework in. Um, and so I managed to find this thing called NetBSD, which isn't Unix, but it's BSD. Uh, I guess BSD is Unix. Um, and, you know, a whole community of people who'd figured out how to install this thing on these old Macs. And so that was sort of my first intro into open source and being on the mailing lists and figuring, like, begging for help and, you know, all that. Yeah. Um, and then over time, I got more involved. I started um, working on the JMeter project, actually. I was one of the I was the very first maintainer it's time. It's JMeter. It's a load test uh, okay. It's part of the Apache okay. Foundation now. It's actually part of Azure. So Azure load testing is based on JMeter. Okay. Uh, so it's survived. This open source project has survived. I don't know how many maintainers for like the last twenty years, but it was. It's a, a load tester basically, and and we needed one. And um, I didn't create it. It was sort of sitting there, but kind of a little bit as open source. You know, they go up and down in terms yeah, yeah. of how many people are maintaining it. So you're like, you're the uh, legit garbage collector. Yeah. Well, it was kind of like I'm the guy who's like, hey, there's some bugs, and it was like crickets, and I was like. Okay, I guess we'll figure out. So, like, me and this other guy kind of patched a bunch of bugs and split it into client server, so you could do like distributed load testing. Um, uh, and then, you know, I did. I went and did a PhD and um, used a lot of open source for that, um, for physics, uh, physics rendering and stuff like that. Um, and then eventually came back to Google, which actually, interestingly enough, is like uses a lot of open source, but doesn't actually do a lot of open source. Yeah. Like, not if you're an employee. Um, and then, but then when we came to do cloud, um, you know, with Docker and a bunch of other stuff, it was just really obvious that it had to be open. I think people were looking for multi-cloud solutions. Yeah. People weren't going to buy some project from like one cloud vendor. It really had to have that ability to be multi-cloud, be on-premise and all that kind of stuff. Um, and, uh, so that's, that's where really it came from. Right, is that yeah. ability, that knowledge that it it couldn't be a project that was associated with any one company? Yeah, it had so to be a project that was. This was this. early 2010s. At, yeah, at like 2012-ish. 2012-ish. Yeah. yeah, so around the basically the inception of Kubernetes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. yeah so it was the, and GCP has been around. It was long? around ish. Like yeah. so, we were starting to kick around. Like the Joe Beta and Craig McClucky, who who started Kubernetes with me, um, they just sort of finished doing uh, VMs, virtual machines, what was what was uh, yeah. virtual machines. And then I was working on uh, some infrastructure as code stuff. And we kind of both sort of wrapped our projects and we were both looking at what Docker was doing. And we just kind of came together and we're like, this is, you know, we, this is going to happen. I think the other yeah. piece of it that was really there was like, it's like, we didn't make this happen, right? Yeah. Like it was going to happen no matter what. So we had this time window when we had a lot of knowledge and a lot of you know expertise, and so we could bring it to bear, and we could maybe be the project that was successful. But it was obvious to us 
that there was going to be a open source project that was successful. Yeah. And I think a lot of people don't realize, like at the time, there was probably eight or ten different open source projects that were doing, yeah, doing roughly some sort of orchestration, right? And Mesos is a famous one, and Docker did Swarm, but there were, um, you know, in fact, a bunch of companies had sort of started to homebrew their own because the yeah. need was just kind of obvious. Um, and I think a lot of open source does come out of that, right? The sort of like, I, I, there's a need here, and then I don't want to have to maintain this thing myself for forever. So how do I get a community around it to take care of it and spread the load? Yeah, and, so can we talk about yeah. that too? Because you chose, like, the Google and the team chose to open source it. So how did you establish, okay, there's employees, there's folks contributing? Like, what was that sort of set up early on? Yeah, well, I mean, it was super informal, I guess I would say, early on. Um, you know, I think we were lucky in the sense that we partnered with Red Hat really early. And so we very, very early on had people from multiple places contributing, yeah. right? And we picked up some other, the CTO of Box um, started being getting excited and contributing and the CoreOS folks got yeah. excited and started contributing. And so over that summer of 2013, after we announced at DockerCon, um, there was a pretty solid crew of like, people across the industry who were, who were pretty active. And so I think we benefited from the fact that we were pretty multi-company from the start. Yeah. And we knew that was where we were going, yeah. right? We never wanted to be fully in control. I'm like really anti-benevolent dictator for life kind yeah. of projects. Okay. Um, and so we kind of always built it to have multiple leaders and, and be democratic. Um, what was interesting is that we... I would say we really didn't do formal governance soon enough. Okay. Right. Um, where we where we wrote down how everything worked. Yeah. Um, and and we did this really interesting survey at one point where we surveyed our users because we never really asked our users like, are you excited? Why are you you know why are you using this yeah. thing? I mean, like, did you have a precedent before that other than it, like you mentioned the like the Python setup yeah. governance? Um, I guess. Java sort of had. Uh, we talked to a bunch of people. I mean, so, yeah. so we had a chance. We were lucky enough that we got a chance to talk to um, some of the folks on the Linux kernel. Okay. Um, we knew a few of them pretty well. And so we got to talk about them, about sort of how they worked. Um, we talked to the Node.js people a lot. Okay. Um, I knew Brian Cantrell, who was involved in Node.js, and we knew a bunch of the other Node.js people. We talked to them a lot about like, hey, like what worked, what didn't work. You know, so we sort of tried to kind of sample. I mean, I agree, I agree with you that like we didn't really have like one model. Yeah. We, we couldn't be like, oh, we are going to be this government. And I think open source still struggles from this. Like yeah. you can be like, oh, I'm an MIT license project or I'm a yeah. BSD. Like, you have a lot of rigor around the license. Yeah. We've got, I mean, at least now I think we've gotten to a place where code of conduct yeah. is at least. Yeah. Yeah. is like a, a, an accepted thing. But even then at the time, that was sort of just when code of conduct as a thing was starting to happen. And and I hope actually, in some sense, I hope we kind of pushed it over the line. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I hope so. I think yeah. GitHub's done a good job of like now it's front and center and you yeah. can see if the, yeah. if it exists, the license exists. And I think even the amount of licenses that are out, like we're talking like maybe 10 that people choose from. It's come down definitely yeah. from like, Oh, I'm going to write my random, like, yeah. you know, mostly looks like MIT, but isn't really, you know, I'm going to give it a funny, funny name or whatever. Like we've come down from that. And that's really good. I do think that there is more that we, people could do to sort of say like, here's, you know, a way that you might think about establishing, you know, rules and secession and, um, you know, like hit by a butt, like stuff that we think actually, actually about on the more corporate side of like, if this person quits tomorrow, what are we going to do? You know, I don't think open source talks about that as much, but burnout is a real thing, yeah. right? And people quit all the time, right? Yeah. Um, and and so I think, you know, uh, even situations like who's got the keys to do the build? Yeah. You know, like yeah, so we've that's... seen situations where it's like one person, right? Like one person, one account. Heaven forbid they get locked out or decide to quit or get hacked or, you know, like all this stuff, right? Um, yeah, it, but it's one of those situations where you don't think about it until you have to. And I oh, think, yeah, for sure. I think um, now we have more precedent because there's a yeah. lot more. Well, Kubernetes, like fast forwarding. We just talked to Taylor from the CNCF. Yeah. So like Kubernetes now being a part of the CNCF. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. I guess essentially kicking that off. It really did. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so now there's like structure. On, yeah. At least in the cloud ecosystem. Yeah. A like, little more. Where is the level? Or yeah. Like where is the sort of minimum plateau of like expectations yeah. before enterprises decide to use yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, it's gotten and better for sure. Yeah, it, it's super helpful to, because uh, I know with open source we had to disclose if we use any sort of copyleft stuff. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because we raised around the funding. So 
Uh, but I was like, oh, I guess this is where this comes into play. Happy yeah, yeah, yeah. we did mostly MIT things. So, yeah. Uh, super helpful. Yeah. Uh, but I did want to like take a step back into you. you had, so I mentioned I, I saw you on the Maintainer Summit a couple years ago. Yeah. Uh, sort of internal slash public conference yeah, for yeah. open source maintainers, and you talked really early days Kubernetes about sort of like the the growth curve. And yeah. you mentioned this earlier too as well. Uh, there was a point where you decided. Okay, this, maybe this is a time yeah. to like step down. Do you, yeah. can you talk about that and like yeah. how you came to that decision? Yeah, I mean, I think you know part of it is the decision is pushed on you. Yeah, right. Like you're just doing other stuff, and you're doing other stuff for good reason. Like I'm doing other stuff because I'm excited about it and I'm interested yeah. in it and I'm learning. And you realize like I'm starting to get in the way. Yeah. Right. Like I am not. Like I'm not 100% on this thing anymore, and and if I try and be 100%, or if I try and keep the same role while I'm not 100%, you're gonna you're gonna block other people. You're gonna block the the process, and in some sense, also like it was an acknowledgement of the fact that um, the project was just too big for it to be about any. Individ any real individuals anyway, right? And I think we've done a lot of work to make it to secession, to do that kind of secession planning. Um, but even in the moment, it's hard, right? Yeah. Like I remember, you know, you realize you're looking at that contributor graph, right? Yeah. And you're still number one on the, in the, as a contributor, but you see number two is coming on you. And I, I have to admit, like I did a month or two where I tried to <laughs> you know, like I tried to squeeze it in nights and weekends and whatever to just try and stay ahead because like I wanted like it was it was yeah, it's a bit I, of clout. Was, That's a, it was a cloud, right? right? Yeah. It was a cloud. And then like I realized and I just have this I had this moment where I was like, this is just this is just stupid. Right. Like you're you're I always say, you know, like it's really dumb to fight against gravity. It's really dumb to fight against water. Like there is this like stuff will just some some stuff will just wear you down and win, yeah. Right, and like that's just wasted energy. Um, and, and it was that kind of moment of like, I don't have this doesn't have to be the thing that defines me for forever. Yeah. Right. And then, then I think also like I still and I was just actually just before we came on the podcast I was still, um, you know I'm the maintainer for a bunch of the Kubernetes client libraries for Java for uh, .NET for uh, TypeScript and the infrastructure that we use to generate the client libraries. And that turned out finding that home was actually also really good because it was like, it was enough of a thing that people actually use it. It's useful, but it's not like an intense thing. And yeah. so it was like, it could kind of keep my hand in. I'd had something that I was working on, um, but, um, but I, but, but it, I could put 20% on it and, yeah. and it wasn't a big deal or I could step away from it for a week and it wasn't a big deal. Right. Yeah. So yeah. I think that was, this that is, was so good. you mentioned core, core S as well being early yeah. adopters and participants. Kelsey Hightower, I think came yeah. from that yeah, 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 organization. Yeah, yeah. And I remember seeing him talk uh, about his days and just doing open source in general. And when he found out he basically, he couldn't open source a thing because then the expectation was, Oh, Kelsey did a thing. Let's, it's tough. Yeah, let's get involved because there's there's definitely that stardom or sort yeah, of yeah, 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 level. Yeah, yeah. I guess stars is a thing, but like yeah. you get to a certain level, it's, you can't just like walk in yeah. and be a normal contributor. Now everyone's sort of like paying attention to your yeah. awful co code. Yeah, it's interesting. I've never really, I mean, I, I've kind of never really let that bother me, I guess, yeah. maybe. Um, uh, and I don't know, like they should tell me, I mean, probably the maintainers should tell me if like it bugs them that I'm sending them code. Cause like I send random PRs to all kinds of different things. In fact, yeah. I recently I've been getting involved with the, um, the bytecode Alliance and the web assembly yeah. folks. Oh, that's and, fun. and I just contributed, um, uh, HTTP client support to the web, to web assembly. Yeah. So you can make, so there's now a standardized way to make HTTP calls. Um, and, uh, I mean, I guess I just tried to show up like a humble member of their community, like anybody else would, and I, th I, I think that's what happened. I don't know. I should talk to them. I guess if they, yeah. if they felt differently, you, but you, like, you never, you never know. I, I remember. So I, I don't think I've met a level of a Kelsey Hightower, but sure. I, I'd love to strive to achieve to make that impact in the community. Yeah. But I remember a couple of weeks ago, I was talking to Adi Osmani, and he's like somebody who's like on oh, the Chrome team. Oh, you do so great, great stuff, and it was like a normal conversation. I was like, I don't know if I'm at his level or whatever, but. Sure. I just want to be able to talk to anybody yeah, yeah, yeah. normally yeah. Uh, and still, but still be able to make an impact. Yeah, yeah. And I think if you're, if that's the goal, then I think it's, it's great. And I know there's benevolent uh, dictators out there that yeah. sort of run the show and stuff like that. Um, 
there's space for all all yeah. between. Yeah. Um, but what I love about Kubernetes, and I guess I don't know if this was pre CNCF or post, like all the SIG groups, all the different yeah. organizations. Like, yeah. were you part of that structure, or was that after? that was no? Yeah, we were part of that. Um, that happened pretty early on, um, and and it was it was in part it was about parallelism, right? So like yeah. one of the big struggles that you have early on is how do you review PRs in a timely way? Yeah. Right. And how do you merge code in a timely way? Right. Because if you don't merge PRs quickly ish, you'll push contributors away. Yeah. Right. Because they want to see, I mean, like nobody wants to write code and have it linger as a pull request for like three months. Right. That just feels crappy. You're like, do they like me? Do they not like me? Like whatever. Um, so you need to deal with PRs in a timely way. And that means you need breadth reviewers, right? Like you need a large number of reviewers. Um, you can't just merge stuff. I mean, like the default thing would be like, oh, sure, it passes a unit test, merge it. No, right? Like, and so we needed a structure where there were people who we trusted who, in a particular area, networking or storage or whatever, we'd be like, if that person says that PR is okay, it's okay and we can merge it, right? And so that very rapidly, I think, led to the SIGs and the that kind of ownership. And they've gotten a little bit more formal over time with like, there's chairs and tech leads and there's a whole bunch of roles and like elections and stuff like that. And a lot of that stuff hadn't exactly gotten formalized in the early days. Although myself and Sarah Novotny and um, uh, a bunch of other people came together to write a lot of that stuff in about 2016, uh, write those documents. Um, so that was, so we did do that eventually, but, but I think that that was, and again, it goes back in some sense to that same, like we don't want a benevolent dictator, right? Yeah. I don't want one person who's like, feels that they own everything we want you know people to specialize in in different areas and that's i mean that's kind of naturally how we split up to begin with like tim as an example tim hawken um kind of took on networking as he i mean he wasn't a network guy he's now like yeah. the kubernetes network guy but like he wasn't a network guy at all right but that was just the area that he kind of took on early yeah. on um and you know other people took on other stuff so i think it just kind of happened naturally it helped that we had a lot of pretty senior pretty talented people yeah you know, so we kind of just trusted each other. And was Tim already established? I don't, I don't know Tim's background. Was he also at Google? Or he somewhere? was also, yeah. He were he was actually, um, uh, yeah. He was a, an engineer on the on the Borg team, actually. Okay. Um, so okay, yeah. excellent. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's like so many, um, like the Kubernetes ecosystem is like pretty amazing. So like yeah. my my intro. So actually, you mentioned DockerCon 2013. Yeah. Uh, that Should've fall, worn that yeah, that fall was actually when I learned how to code professionally. Oh, wow, cool! So I was more of like a copy paster, sure, could sure. do a little bit of JavaScript. I mean, I can still copy paste. I'm yeah, not gonna I'm not gonna yeah. lie. Yeah, well, now you got Copilot. The Copilot so. is the yeah. Now I just Copilot. I, I actually just uh, used Copilot chat last night because yeah. uh, someone didn't write any tests. A contributor didn't write any tests for their stuff. Right. So I'm like, oh, let me just like present the test for you. Right. I don't have the, I don't have the time to like go and write it for you, but yeah. Copilot can. It and it did it? It did it. Wow. And then I That's dropped so cool. it. I dropped it in. It's like, hey, Copilot generated, but here's some yeah, tests. Yeah, yeah. Could you like this? add this to a test suite? That's so cool. And um, yeah, but what I was getting at is, uh, so I learned how to code 2013 in the fall. Yeah. Uh, and I remember specifically Tampa, Florida, the Tampa Ruby Brigade. Okay. There was a Docker employee. Right. And he was like going through the whole ecosystem like cloud. And it's like melted my brain because I'm like, oh, I didn't know any of this existed. I just know how to write Ruby scripts and some jQuery. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. Um, it was ama like two years later or three years later, I ended up joining, joining Netlify. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so early days, Netlify employee number three. Right. And that also melted my brain because David Calavera, who was a CTO, came from Docker. Right. And then they implemented basically GitHub pages yeah, yeah. as a full on product yeah, yeah, yeah. powered by Kubernetes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I was like, oh, wow. It's, uh, you could do what normally you'd do manually, like with a, a Git push or you get, you get the Git ops thing going. Yeah. But now it's just like it's magic behind yeah, the yeah, scenes. Yeah, that's awesome. And uh, what now what I've noticed since my career started is now Kubernetes is kind of being abstracted away. Yeah, it's starting to happen. And it's uh, like you don't need to be that low level yeah, to yeah. be successful. Yeah, so yeah, like yeah. what your I guess what your I got maybe with your role today at in, yeah. in Azure is that the goal is like oh yeah abstract yeah. that away. Yeah, yeah it's a hundred percent the goal. It has yeah. been the goal. In fact, I mean I guess I would say that like in some sense what took it so long. Yeah. Right. Like we were we were we were thinking that this people was, just really love YAML. <laughs> yeah. And I think it's hard. I mean, I think I think that one of the other things is that like some abstraction layers come easier than others in terms of the con like everybody can kind of agree on the concepts. Yeah. Um, I think the developer platform stuff has been hard. And I think in some sense it's because it's really easy to see a really great let's say like GitHub pages style interface. Cause yeah. mark, it's you can make decisions like, oh, it's markdown. A, it's just web pages. It's, you know, like you can really streamline 
that experience. You can be Jamstack. You can be like, here, this is yeah. what Jamstack is, right? Like, and you can just streamline that experience. But to build something that is higher level, but still generic enough to go everywhere, it's hard, yeah. right? Like, you look at, you're like, okay, like POSIX threads, POSIX locks, like, what are the components, right? And I think yeah. we've just been kind of, we're slowly building up some of these ideas. And I think it didn't help that some of the early versions of this, like if you look at um, traditional uh, functions as a service, which it, it kind of smashed together the programming experience and the way that it runs. Yeah. And you kind of want to say like, no, no, actually I want that like event driven programming style, but I want it in my own container and I want it running in Kubernetes because I don't want to do pay by request. I want to do pay by core. Right, and like the business model part of it got smashed up with the programming model part of it, yeah. Um, in a way that I think made forced people to make some bad choices, right? Um, so I think we're slowly putting the pieces back together. I do like to point out to people that, like, you know, like Windows as an operating system took I don't know 30 years to develop, right? Not Windows specifically, but like if you say the operating system idea sort of started in 1960. Yeah. Right. It takes 30 years to get to being like, okay, we need print drivers and we need network drivers and we need menus and buttons and like all these ideas sort of slowly accumulated, you know? Um, and I think that's, so I'm, I'm like, maybe we'll have some patience. It might yeah. take 30 years to get there on top of Kubernetes too. Um, but it's happening, you know? Um, yeah. And it's the, um, it's like the, the cloud is seeing that same sort of evolution yeah. where like the late 2000s, you know, we got the first versions of AWS and then yeah. Azure. I don't know what Azure was called before, but um, Azure. It's Azure. It's been Azure. It's always been Azure? Okay. It was Windows Azure for a while. Okay. Now it's Microsoft Azure. But, got it. You know, yeah. yeah. So we have all these these uh, all these cloud offerings. And I'm uh, I'm very much, so funny enough, I, I interviewed in Go at Netlify. Okay. But when I got there, I wrote JavaScript. Okay. Because no one else wanted to do that. So I never right. really got deep in the Kubernetes world. Yeah, yeah. I just knew how to run yeah, and yeah, do the stuff yeah, and deploy. Yeah. But that's good, I think, right? Yeah. So like my, my benefit is I never had to be down in, yeah. in, in, in close to the kernel. Yeah, yeah. But really, like the deploys happen. It's magic. Yeah. Now I get to go like do weird animations and make boxes purple and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, like, that's yeah. Like if you can specialize in a different area, you get so much advancement on the yeah, other end. Yeah, yeah, which yeah, is yeah, like, yeah, yeah. You mentioned even like web web assembly. Like we've yeah. gone like even with the runtimes. Like there's so much more advancement that we can think about. Yeah. differently. So like yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you, yeah. I guess what's your opinion? Do you think that there's less of a need of having developers and like the low code no code movement is gonna make it easier for people to just like stay? Yeah. Their boundaries? I think it's a both. I'm going to say it's a both, right? Yeah. Like, I am 100% certain that there's enough problems out there that are hard enough that you need full on developers who have got, you know, developer training. And, and I think I was, I'm always a little surprised when people are worried about, like, oh, Copilot's going to come and take your job or what. Yeah. Like, I'm like, no, no, you're just going to be able to build more solutions to harder problems yeah. faster. Right. And it's just like a compiler or anything else. Right. Like you just we're just going to build more stuff. Um, but I do think low code and no code is really powerful. Um, and I, I think the, that ability to bring in the citizen developer, bring in the, you know, like even look at something like COVID where teachers could use low code, no code tools to build online experiences for their classes. Right. Like that's huge. I think like that kind of like I don't really know, like honestly, in some level, exactly what you said, like I actually don't even want to be in the this part of the tech area. I just want my thing to work. Yeah. Right. Um, and I think the truth is that like we make this distinction also between like low code, no code and pro dev or whatever. Honest to God truth. I'm lazy as hell. Like I want to do it in low code too sometimes. Right. Yeah. Like I don't, I don't like sometimes it's you fun. can't, like, it's not just fun. It's like, yeah. I, I want like, I want to build an app where you press a button and my Christmas tree turns on. Like <laughs> how much time do I want to spend writing that app? Like not a lot of time, right? But I want it to work. And so like, that's where that kind of like low code, you know, was because like you said, you did, did the front end stuff. Like I can sort of do front end, but like, you don't want to see the front end. Like my wife was using some of this, this internal tool I built inside our house to like, that turns on the lights and stuff like that. And she's like, <laughs> oh, so you actually built the Christmas light? Oh yeah, 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 I did all this stuff. Yeah, 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 yeah. But she's, she's always like, I'm watching her use it and I'm like, oh yeah, that doesn't work. Oh yeah, that's a bug. Oh uh, yeah, I didn't quite figure out how to do the layout right there. You know, yeah. like so it, it's like, like that TikTok where the um it's the designers versus the QA. Yeah, yeah. Where they have uh, like the square peg. Yeah. And they're trying they're putting everything through the circle hole. Yeah. Because yeah, yeah. everything fits that way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, amazing. Yeah. yeah. So it's uh it it also I was just talking to somebody oh, actually here after the the keynote, talking about like the 
the age old problem of you go to solve the problem, but then you realize, oh, we need this thing and yeah. then this thing. So then you pivot your entire company to be that yeah. thing or that dev tool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And like what I like about what's happening with AI right now, like with OpenAI, is they just like raise, like basically the tide's been risen. Like yeah. I don't have to go train my own models. Like yeah, yeah. there's a model I can opt into. Yeah. And uh, for, I think we have our, our first AI feature that shipped on Monday. Yeah. It's cost us seven cents so far. Oh my gosh. Oh, that's yeah. Awesome. And it's been public since, uh, since Monday. Yeah. 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 Uh, so it's like, it's not intense. Like it's probably gonna cost a hundred bucks eventually when we get product market fit. But yeah, yeah. the goal there is like, we can just ship this. I shipped it on a weekend. Basically. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like now I can go do the next thing and then yeah. I can do like a couple of weekend projects, test it out without getting up a GPU and be like, okay, let me send this input. Let yeah. me send that output. Let me retrain over here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And I think we, I mean, I think Kubernetes did this as well. I think we have these moments where you tell people like, oh, there's that whole class of stuff that you used to think you had to worry about in order to get, like, I think AI is an example. Think about all the training and inference. If they, the first thing they said was like, get a whole bunch of machines together, yeah. figure out how to like, distribute work to all those machines. Okay, now we can do AI, right? No, yeah. they got to say like, okay, we have this orchestrator. Once you have an orchestrator, it's much easier to build a training system. Once you have the trained models, you can just say like, I want to be able to do, I can do so much more on top, right? And I think that's really great because it, um, it democratizes the innovation. Yeah. Because quite frankly, and we saw this in infrastructure too, like the people who are really good at infrastructure or the people who are really good at AI, they're not necessarily really good at seeing a great model, you know, business that you can build on top of AI or on top of infrastructure because yeah. right? they're focused on, um, they, they like the low level thing, right? Or the medium level thing. And I think that democratization of the innovation is huge, right? Just getting people's imagination up about it. Yeah. And it's, it's all about the, um, access to as well. Cause I know they're yeah. like having, so thank you, Microsoft, our friends at Microsoft to give us space to do the podcast here. Yeah. But also there's like, there's a bunch of college students who are doing TikToks here. At yeah, the yeah, event. yeah, yeah. So like even getting the education, um, yeah. like the students coming through, come to build, get exposure early days in their yeah. career or be pre their yeah. career. Yeah. Like now they're able to be like, oh yeah, this is just normal. Like this yeah. is just like, this is just the stakes of being a developer. Yeah, Let me yeah, just yeah. move on to the next thing. Yeah. And now you see a bunch of kids now doing AI, one-off bootstrapped, uh, lifestyle type businesses where they're making like 20 K a month yeah, yeah, because yeah. they had a cool idea to make Grammarly in yeah, their yeah. specific situation for their college. For sure. For sure. Yeah. And I think that like, I mean, I think about when I was even 15 years ago when I was doing my PhD, we put a ton of work into just things like object recognition. I was doing yeah. robotics and it was ton of the work into like, can I just figure out that that's a cup? <laughs> right. That's an API call now. I mean, that's like a little bit of TypeScript in an yeah. API call. Right. So like I, that's huge. I think that's, that's, that's really, uh, and I think that, that even just that idea that, you know, your app can be a bunch of API calls, a bunch of cloud API calls, yeah. as opposed to like you doing it all yourself and you're doing this integration, you know, your job is to have the idea and to figure out how to integrate and know what's available yeah. um, rather than like build it all. I think that's, that's also really good. Right? Yeah. It's the, uh, so this is the thing. So I was at, at GitHub uh, for almost five years and saw, I was basically pre GitHub actions. Mm. So we saw that get shipped and we saw, I basically saw the CI CD get shipped. Yeah. And we all predicted this internally, like the commoditization of CI CD. Oh yeah, for sure. It's, it's basically table stakes for yeah, yeah, yeah. CI CD. So now like, what's your thing on top of that? Yeah. Like what's the, what's the developer experience? So yeah. like, uh, I think of like folks like the former Docker folks, uh, Solomon's doing Dapper. the dagger dagger yeah. or is it dagger? Yeah. Da dagger.io. Yeah. yeah. So dagger is like providing even a better experience on top of GitHub actions yeah, yeah. and a better experience than a bunch of other CI tools. Yeah. And all we need to do is like be able to local test the yeah, stuff yeah. and like, doesn't matter your environment. Like it just works. Yeah. Like now, that when I was teaching GitHub Action CI/CD, like for college students, for boot camp grads, it was a lot of sort of like I got to ramp you up yeah, to get yeah, to yeah. where you need to be, so you understand this. Now yeah. it's just like, oh, yeah, it's a YAML file inside my GitHub repo. Yeah, yeah, I'm yeah. good to go. Yeah, no, that's 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 huge, and I think the ease. I mean, like I love Dependabot, CodeQL, and yeah, that integration of like, oh, I can actually have this automation, easy, like this thing yeah. will run in the background, update my stuff, or. Uh, I've, I mean, literally, I've had CodeQL go and find security problems in my code. Like, yeah. honest to God, yes, that's a bug. Yes, it's a security problem. Yes, I screwed that up. Thanks for pointing me out, right? Like, and to me, that's the thing that wins me, Yeah. right? Is, is that moment when you're like, oh, this is actually making me better. You know, this isn't just making me feel good. This is actually literally making me better. Yeah, no, I mean, it's same. Like, we have it, I've had it since I was at GitHub, so I have everything installed yeah. in my repos because 
if I can help, because we onboard a lot of new contributors through open source. And yeah, um, there was a, there was a thing you actually mentioned in the talk I keep referring to. Sure. Uh, it's on YouTube, by the way. If yeah, anyone wants to go watch it. Yeah, I don't remember the name, but we'll probably link it in the in the yeah. show notes as well. But around issues versus pull requests and issues is a good like it's a good metric to see use, and then PRs yeah. is a good metric to see interest. Yeah, but there are a couple sure. other pillars of like how you see engagement. Um, I don't know if you even remember. Yeah, I mean, it was a while ago, so maybe I have to go back and watch the YouTube myself. But I think you're absolutely right, right? Like one of the challenges, I think a lot of the, one of the challenges of open source oftentimes is understanding who's using you, how are they using you? Because you know you love, you put your product hat on and you're like, I'm going to write all this telemetry code and it's going to ship all these logs back to me and I'll know exactly yeah. what's going on. And like, and you're then you're like, yeah, but my users are not going to be okay with this, right? Yeah. Um, so actually, speaking of like maybe startup idea, anyone need a startup idea? If we could figure out how to do properly anonymized like aggregate statistics for open source projects that everybody loved, that's that's a bonus. Um, <laughs> Sounds like an open source problem. There you go. There you go. Um, so, but yeah, it's hard to know. And so, like we were trying, we were always trying to figure out like it downloads is a pretty lousy metric because yeah. CI/CD comes along and like yeah, you just spikes your downloads yeah. and you're like we're awesome and you're like no, actually that's just repetitive <laughs> testing. Um, issues is really good because of course like we don't write bug free code. Spoiler alert. Um, so people are gonna have problems. People are gonna get confused and like you know so like that's a really good proxy for if people are using you, like if you're, if nobody's filing issues, I'm sorry. It's not that you're a beautiful co programmer. It's that you're, nobody's using your stuff. Yeah. Right. Um, and, and then PRs. Yeah. I think like, cause it's, it takes a little bit to get up and to actually send a PR, right. It's a commitment. Um, and, uh, so that's a pretty good proxy for like, if people are actually interested in helping you. Yeah. Um, and if you build a welcoming community too, I think, right. Cause sometimes people are like, well, I would contribute, but like this guy was a jackass on like, <laughs> you know, that PR and I'm not going to go near, you know, it's, it's, I think, I think the way that your repo feels is really important. Right. Yeah. I think one of the things we really worked on hard in the Kubernetes community was to be welcoming to like, um, make sure we were responsive. Right. Like even if it was just to say like, Hey, yeah, we got your issue. We're looking at it you know, we'll be back to you in, in a day or whatever, right? Setting those expectations. Like, that's huge for getting, um, I think that people, I mean, maybe one of the other things I'd say is like, I think people, when they think about open source projects, you know, they kind of get narrow focus on their open source project. Yeah. And what they don't really realize is that for, for the consumer, their project doesn't exist in the vacuum. There's like 50 other projects that that person could be using, could be interested in, could be contributing to. It's a competitive landscape, right? Yeah. And people are going to go to the one that is the friendliest and is the yeah. most responsive and like lights their dopamine responses and all that stuff. Right. And so you can't just sort of assume that like people will come to you. You have to realize that you're competing, yeah. especially in the early days. You're well, competing. Right? Open source is marketing. Yeah. It's like if you do the, the clear sort of how do you convert people yeah. <laughs> through your quote unquote open source funnel. Yeah. Like that is where success lies. Yeah. And it's like. Yeah, we don't have to read between the tea leaves. It's it's basically there's quite a few projects I see in the JavaScript ecosystem who yeah. had a cool logo or spoke at a, the right conference at the right time. Yeah, and that's the thing we used. Yeah, 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 yeah for sure. And and I think that and, and I don't think that we should think of that as a bad thing either, yeah. right? Because it's that same sort of like you're going to have creative innovation and a lot of Cambrian explosion, and then you know whatever the, the right things win, and the the winning part is good actually because it concentrates the ecosystem, right? Because yeah. like, if we kept trying to have a hundred different variations of the same thing, it would be so diffuse, none of them would be any good, right? Yeah. And so, but but I do think it's important for people who want to build successful open source to realize that, you know, it is, as you say, like it's as much marketing as it is good idea. Like sometimes every once in a while, there's an amazing idea um, and, and, you know, there's just nothing else like it. Um, but a lot of times it's just like, are you friendly or are you, do you look, you know, do you look alive? Right. Like, I mean, I, I, am not joking. Like I go to a GitHub project, I'm looking at when the last commit was Yeah, hundred percent of the time. If I'm thinking about whether I want it, well, every once in a while it's like, oh yeah, that has exactly what I want. So I'm going to use it no matter what. In fact, I picked up an archive project the other day because it was like literally exactly what I wanted. And somebody had already done all of the hard work, but most of the time I'm looking, uh, you know, is it alive? Right. Are they responding to issues? Are they merging PRs? Um, and you know, is there diversity in the people who are merging PRs? You don't want just like the one person who's running yeah. the whole thing, right? Um, yeah. I so. mean, th I think that's a, a, a good place to wind down the conversation. I know cool. we have limited time. Yeah, yeah. Uh, definitely would love to, uh, for you to check out open source. Cause All right. it, no, I'll check what, that out. What you just mentioned is what we have. 
All right. in our dashboard. That liveness. Um, yeah, yeah. The Next, liveness. you have to do the trustworthiness. Yeah. Here, I, I, the thing I really want people to figure out is... Um, it's that validation I, piece, yeah. Not just validation, but like I've always said, like it's very hard to tell if you're walking around in a bad neighborhood on <laughs> GitHub, <laughs> right? That is a good, like, a good, um, you know, a, a good and, anecdote, really. And and so like, I'm taking on this open source dependency. Like, how risky is it? It's really hard to know, right? Like, you can be like, oh, like, you know, oh, it's coming from Microsoft or oh, it's coming from AWS or whatever, and then you're like, okay, I can trust this, right? Yeah, hundred percent, right? But there's a lot of in the middle ground projects. Where you're like, you know, it looks like it's an enthusiast. It looks like it's a person who's just kind of putting their love out there, or it looks like it's a startup that's doing its thing. But how do I know, yeah. right? Like, you yeah, know, that's, and, that's a that's a good point. This is something that came up when I was uh, at GitHub, and I was I was part of the JS Foundation as like as just sort of attendee. Yeah, uh, I wasn't any sort of board member or anything like that. And the conversation, like, how do we bring more to people to fold? But also. I was able to contribute to Node.js because I worked at GitHub. Yeah. So it was like automatic pattern matching. You, you're validated. You're not going to disappear. You have a stable job. Uh, but when you don't know what's going on and what the ulterior motive is for this random, yeah. you know, I don't know, Go package. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. It, it is nice to know, okay, who are you? Where'd you come from? Who are your friends? Yeah, 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 and, exactly. Um, like, what are your yeah. references? I mean, it, I mean, I, and I don't think it's, like, it sounds like it could be exclusionary. And I, I think we you have to be careful that it's not, yeah. right? Because some 14 year old kid pops up for the first time, like you want that person to feel welcomed. Yeah. Right. It's just the trouble is, you know, as I said on the internet, like it's just hard to know, like, is it a 14 year old kid or is it a nation state attacker? <laughs> right. Like, yeah. And this, there's uh, interesting you know? things we'd have to get into about the government and trying to figure out yeah. who's contributing to what open source project from what country. Yeah. Yeah, uh, exactly. And, and, I, and so I think that knowing that, that, and then I, I think also potentially carrying it into the dependencies because we've also yeah. seen, you know, it was a legit project. It was yeah. an enthusiast thing, but they got tired and they handed over to some other maintainer and yeah. that maintainer turned out to be a malicious actor. And, you know, and then I pick up the dependency and I would kind of like to know, like, I trusted that guy, but suddenly 50% of the new code is from this other person who you haven't, you know, yeah. know right? Yeah. Um, so I don't know, It's it, I, but I think it's a, it, I think, I guess what I would say is, I think eventually it's gonna, it's already, I think, putting a little bit of a chilling effect on people adopting open source. Yeah, there, right. There, yeah. There's been a, a couple of recent waves around these sort of pre pervasive incentive, which is, uh, I think, was it Core JS has had an article uh, yeah. go out a couple like last month around the maintainer made forty seven dollars a month. They're based yeah. in Europe, and they were just like, "Hey, I would love to get paid for this. I don't, yeah. and it's supported by hundreds of thousands of projects, really, probably more, probably in the millions, to be honest." Yeah, and they're like, I don't want to. There's one. He doesn't want to come to this, but he's he is threatening the idea of, oh, I need to, yeah, you know, do something, take it down or whatnot, and yeah. like see if the internet un implodes. Yeah, um, which is challenging. I know npm set up to like have not, not have that for happen. That. Yeah, and yeah. GitHub's also set up the news features where the link between repositories and releases to npm packages now yeah. exists for npm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, but it, it doesn't exist for every other package manager. Yeah, so. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's an interesting problem. It's a real interesting uh, challenge. We definitely yeah, can't sure. solve it here in no. this conversation. No, no, no. Uh, but yeah, happy to, that we got connected. Um, yeah. Looking forward to seeing more of what your team and sure. seeing more stuff from Kubernetes uh, and yeah. all the offshoots. And yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think the other nice thing you talked about, the leaving part, like one of the other nice things that happened yeah. is that like I've got some really great people on my team who yeah. are contributing, who are SIG leads, who are reviewers. And like, so I think the other part that happens is you develop people who, and you give them that opportunity. Yeah. Right? And I, I think the, the one question, the thing you mentioned early is if you can create other like folks to follow you and like pick yeah. up the mantle, like that's where it's at. Cause I think yeah. a lot of people, when I mentioned Kelsey, there's folks at Google hit distinguish and it's either do business like problem solve those or continue down the open source route yeah and you won't get your next like it's not hard or fast but like do you get your next promotion because you do open source probably not do you get yeah. your next promotion because you helped this percentage point of the business grow yeah uh so people have to decide okay do i need to like take my career seriously which i, I don't want to say open source is not taking a career seriously i think very very powerful for mid mid level engineers senior engineers to do open source yeah but a lot of folks have seen I've seen get that crossroads and they're like yeah I'm gonna choose career or I'm gonna take the management role where I can't be as involved yeah 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 you can still be involved I mean I, yeah. I yeah but it is a trick yeah for yeah. sure 
for sure. Yeah, well, so. I mean, you, you, you fit the pattern. You found the SDKs to... Uh, yeah, exactly. To I mean, I found that, and I you know, kick around every once in a while. I find it hard not to write open source code. Yeah. Like, All But right. that's like reading a book for me. It's like, that's relaxing. I'm not yeah. doing it for career cool. I'm yeah doing it I'm, I'm gonna it, look you, you up know? on open sauce and uh see your your, your contributions all right you do that you. I will, you know, let me know let me know all right let i'll send it over to you i think uh you might be i might have your email all right cool <laughs> excellent good. well uh thanks for the conversation i know Absolutely. we like kind of like wind this down a couple times but yeah, no, I'll, I'll shut up now. <laughs> yeah we could definitely talk longer for sure yeah. uh, we'll have a part two next build fair enough uh and uh listeners stay saucy